forget what it was like when he gave me life. I was dead in my sins, hopeless, any dream of life crushed. In the grip of darkness, without any true source of light, chose me when I had nothing to offer him, but that's who he is. His love flowed through my soul. He said, awake, awake. So I wish to ask you a question as we begin today. Um, it's a question that an atheist turned follower of Christ asked in 1940. And the question is this, in life have you settled to being a chisel when you were created by God to thrive as a child? C.S. Lewis said it this way, a merciful man who desires to do God's will serves his neighbor. A cruel man persecutes his neighbor. But he too is used by God without consent or knowledge to serve his neighbor. The difference is that the first man serves God as a son and the second as a tool. The first as a child and the second as a chisel. Something that I love in almost anything is to be taken behind the scenes of something. I'm a sucker for those things. I'm a sucker to see how a meal was prepared, not just served. I'm a real, real sucker to see like how a team practices, not just how they play. I love those things. And one of the things that I love about God's word is when it looks, when it looks towards Holy Week and it looks to everything that Jesus has accomplished this week, it actually takes us right back to the beginning and shows us not only what Jesus did, but how he lives his life that gave him the ability to stand rooted in the midst of all that is going to transpire this week. And so what I want us to do today is I want us to reread a passage of the Palm Sunday scripture that has already been read over us today. And then I want us to go behind the scenes and see some specific ways that Jesus lived differently in the world. And it's a call not only for us to look at how Jesus lived differently, but it's an invitation that we too would live like Jesus, different in the world in which we live. It gives us critical insights. And so a prophetic word we're about to see come to pass is about one of 300 that, that talks about Jesus as Messiah. One is that he comes riding in on a colt, and we're gonna see Jesus fulfill this. The next thing we're gonna see, as we have already heard, we're gonna read again, is you're gonna hear about cloaks being laid down on the road, which is a symbol of submission to Jesus as king. Now, Jesus is going to be a king in a way that they cannot yet see, and it's gonna cause some to reject his kingship following this moment, but Nevertheless, Jesus is a king. Followed by laying down of palm branches, which was a symbol of Jewish victory. And lastly, these shouts of Hosanna, which directly translated as just, oh, save. Would you save us, O king? Would you lead us into victory? This is the cry. And Luke chapter 19, verse 28 says, and when he had said these things, Jesus, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. Dropping down to verse 35, everything I just mentioned, let's read. And they, and they brought it to Jesus and throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. And as he rode along, they spread their cloaks on the road. And as he was drawing near already on the way down the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. 
And so as you've already heard time and time again this morning, Palm Sunday does indeed kick off what the church calls Holy Week. Our salvation and our freedom and our future following Jesus hinge exclusively and entirely without hyperbolic hyperbolic statements whatsoever. Everything in Christ hinges exclusively and entirely on Jesus fulfilling everything in this week. This week, 2,000 plus years ago, here's what happens. The outer world stands amazed at the inner life of Jesus. The outer world stands amazed at the inner life of Jesus. To take us behind the scenes, let's read from Isaiah, Philippians, and then Luke. Because this is a story like no other. If you and I were God, and turn the person beside you and say, thank God you're not God. (laughs) If I was God, the Leafs would not have won last night. If I was God, they would never win again. Some of you are already offended. I don't care. I'm not God, don't worry about it, I don't have any power. I'm just spitting words, they mean nothing. Here's what it says, though. If you and I were God, there's a way that we, if we would come to earth, we would, we would do things differently. But Isaiah 53, verse 2 says, then in regards to the man Jesus, he had no form or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. And so when God comes to earth, God comes in the form of a man But he doesn't come as a tall man or as a handsome man. He doesn't come in the way that others would go, oh, there's something special and significant. If you looked only on the exterior, Isaiah prophesies that the ordinariness of Jesus, that there would be nothing that would be compelling if you looked at him on the exterior. No advantage whatsoever how, God, how Jesus looked. And if that isn't enough, Philippians takes it even further. Having this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. So not only does Jesus look just, not just ordinary, there is nothing that you would look and go, wow, special. Not only that, it says he takes on, he empties himself by taking on the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. So nothing on the exterior whatsoever, and then not only nothing on the exterior whatsoever, now he takes the position of a servant. From Jesus' time till this time, it hasn't changed much. Do you know who the most unnoticed people in the world are? Those who just serve. Those who serve. Oh, we have red carpets for celebrity, but those who are serving the celebrities, they do not get in the photos. It's not how we work. So nothing on the exterior, nothing whatsoever, and then he goes further and he takes the form of a servant. Now you and I, even when we're coming to church, we work on the exterior. I mean today, one of two things. I have gotten ready for Palm Sunday or brunch in Boko Rotan. One of those two things has happened. Every, Every Palm Sunday I wear a cardigan. I wear an Arnold Palmer cardigan on Palm Sunday. So some of you connect those dots, it's a ha ha. Others of you, Lord bless you. But we work hard in a time of filters, in a time of putting our best foot forward. We're not even God and we're constantly doing this, wanting people to see a projection of who we are. Yet everything about Jesus is different. Everything about Jesus is different. Nothing on the outside that we would desire him and then if that isn't enough, he takes on the form of a servant. Philippians does it so well. Jesus was God and everyone say? So it says it so well. Jesus did not live grasping for the privileges of deity. Why? Because he was abiding in who he was. 
He did not need any of those things. He did not have to wrestle and fight for. It's one of the most profound things that he roots in that is so very differently. Instead, knowing whom he was, he empties himself, becomes human to serve humanity. And from this posture, it says that the child grew and became strong. And Luke identifies two inside things that Jesus grows in. He grows in wisdom and he grows in the favor of God that was upon him. And that is so critical and vital in Luke 2. He grows in wisdom and he grows in the favor of God that was upon him as the son of God. So sure, we can talk about chronological growth, but Luke makes it clear that he is speaking about the interior life of Jesus growing strong equally in wisdom and as a son in the favor of his father. You know, David is described in the Old Testament as being ruddy and handsome, and Saul is described as being like a head taller than everybody else, and Abraham's wife Sarah or Esther, they are known for their physical beauty. But once again, Jesus from the outside has no advantages that would prop him up or propel him forward. However, Jesus on the inside, the way in which he lived his life, not just on this day, but daily, created a hunger and a thirst for those who saw him or got around him that they knew that he was distinctively different. Tim Ross says it this way, that Jesus picked 12 disciples, but town after town after town after town after town, something interesting happened. Jesus, yes, picked 12 disciples, but everywhere that Jesus went, though there was nothing on the outside that would draw them, though he takes on the form of a servant, sinners and tax collectors picked Jesus. There's a fragrance about his life. There's an aroma about his life that is distinctively separate and different from what they had seen in maybe Pharisees and Sadducees. There was something different about Jesus. And again, it wasn't an exterior thing. It was something deeper on the inside. To grow in wisdom, you and I, we have to sometimes look back at some of the decisions that we've made, good and bad. We have to look where we're at right now, and maybe we have to dream ahead. But then we have to ask, in light of who God is and who I am in Christ, what is the wise thing for me to do? Loved ones, think about what could be with me just for a moment on this Palm Sunday. Think about what could be If we as the church of Jesus Christ could care less about exterior things and care more about Christ's likeness in us. Think about the call of God to the church of Christ in this season when the world reverberates is that, that, that there is not sometimes an aroma of Christ on the church. There is a stench of self-righteousness that they pick up on. What it could be if you and I were to be confessional and repented of that and understand that if we begin to follow in a way that is not the way of Jesus, that we can confess, we can repent, and we can return to our first love and say, Father, would you do something in me that creates a fragrance that others notice, not notice me, but when they notice me, it gives me an opportunity to point to you. It gives me the privilege and the honor It gives me the trust to engage the conversation that needs to be had, not my right to engage the conversation. Jesus lays down these things and it opens up the door for him to talk about anything. It's amazing when you look Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. It is remarkable, it is remarkable to me that Jesus has the opportunity to speak to the core issues of people in front of him. The very things often that we want. Don't you wish some, okay, anybody anybody in relationship with anyone that you wish you could talk to them about that? Can I see your hands, please? No? I promise you there's people in your life who want to talk to you about that. I don't know what that is, but it's important. So oftentimes, again, we want to force our way in there, but if we would commit ourselves to allowing Christ to work in us, that door, I do believe, will open. Jesus daily grows in both, in wisdom 
and in the favor of his father. And again, it becomes a fragrance that others notice. At, at 12, this becomes apparent when he and his parents go to Jerusalem for the feast of Passover. By the way, Jesus is in Jerusalem often. Him, Jesus and Jerusalem are interwoven together. Jesus and this week looking at Jerusalem are interwoven together. And Church of Jesus Christ, when Jesus returns, Jesus and Jerusalem are interwoven together. Here's what it says at 12. At 12 years old, after three days, so it, Jesus and his parents go to Jerusalem for the feast of Passover. Unbeknownst to the parents, they leave Jerusalem. They don't know Jesus isn't with them, which makes me hunger for a type of parenting that they had that we don't have today. <laughs> There's no helicopter parents to hear, man. No dropping a pin telling us where you are. It's just like they just leave. They don't just leave the temple. They leave the city. <laughs> I was born in the wrong era. <laughs> they leave the city. But Jesus lingers. And after three days, they found him in the temple, sitting amongst the teachers. What is Jesus doing? Here's what it says. He is sitting. He's God. Like when the world came into existence, he was there. But he's emptied himself. Nothing on the outside that they would think he's special. And they are sitting with God. And here's what it says. The first thing we see Jesus doing with the teachers, he listens to them. <laughs> May God bless you with somebody in your life that it takes tremendous patience to listen to them. Turn the person beside you and say, get behind me, Satan, that's not for me. <laughs> As I aforementioned, my mother and I happened to be at the Sens game last night. Painful. And we had a Leaf, we were surrounded by Leaf fans. They are like a virus. <laughs> Multiplied. And one was behind, quite vocal. And the, look at, they had reason to be vocal. And they were driving me nuts. And I did so well until one moment where I just turned and went, like, gave him a look like, shut up. <laughs> and then I felt bad, but not bad enough to confess. <laughs> so, the Lord is still working. Listening to them and asking them questions. And all were heard were him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. And here's what it says. And when his parents saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, son, why have you treated us so? Behold, your father and I have been searching for you in great distress. Remember, Jesus is 12. So I think that there's a beautiful human element here because this is like a perfectly appropriate 12-year-old response. Like, why were you looking for me? <laughs> I think that's fantastic. But then what does he say? Did you not know that I must be? What? That I can be? That when it's convenient for me to be? When I'll make time for it? No, he said, do you know that, that, that I must be in my father's house? What I wish to say next, I desire to do so with compassion and clarity. Compassion is that I understand church pain. I really, really do. I understand wounding others, and I understand being profoundly wounded myself. I have the scars to prove it. So I would never diminish nor try to cover up anything the Holy Spirit desires to reveal in this church or any church or in his church. None of that is meant to tarnish any of this. But I wish to say with clarity the following. For some of you, you are being formed by people who claim to have a love for God and a disdain for his church. You need to exercise wisdom in who you allow yourself to be influenced by when the way they live their life is not the way that the one that we claim to worship lived his life in reference not only to his father, but also his father's house. And if there was anyone who had an opportunity 
to deconstruct what the temple had become, it's Jesus. Let me remind you, he didn't show up at a perfect synagogue, okay? And he does engage in healthy deconstructing, deconstruction. You have heard it said, but I say to you, but what Jesus doesn't do is he never dishonors them, nor does he ever dishonor his father, nor does he ever dishonor his father's house. May we have ears to hear and hearts that are receptive. Growing up, because growing up, Jesus displays a very specific love for God's presence, for God's place, and for God's purpose. We in North America reverse it. We put purpose first, and then from purpose we get place, and then if we have time left over, we actually think about God's presence. But the way in which Jesus lived was totally the other way around. He prioritized the presence of God, then the place of God, and then from there, he had purpose. Again, we reverse it, and we wonder why we're always discontent. Jesus had it the other way around. And so because you and I bear, as Christians or little Christians, Christ's or followers of Christ because we bear his name. These three loves must also mark our daily lives. Lori and I have been having an ongoing conversation initiated initially by Lori and more often by Lori, no question, but we've been having this ongoing conversation for the betterment of about a year at least. And there's this hunger. There is not a place of discontentment, but come on, how many of you know that there is a growing hunger for the presence of God, not just the theology of God, but the experience of God. Not just talking about God, but the manifest presence of God. Here's what I absolutely believe God is trying to do, and I want to invite all of us. This is not me as pastor on a platform. No, no. I'm just a part of the body. Picture in your mind two circles. In one circle, some people view church this way. Two circles. In circle number one is pastor and everyone else is like the church. That's garbage. Throw that out. That is not biblical. Some of you have come from churches where it's like the pastor is in circle one and everyone, and everyone else is in circle two. That's not biblical. The only model we should have in these two circles is Jesus is in circle one and the body is in the next one. And every single one of us are called to honor and serve the Lord. So I just play a part. I just play a part. It is also why celebrity Christianity is the the antithesis to who Jesus was. It will never lead us to the way of Jesus. But there is this thing, when you and I as the body of Christ, it's an invitation to come together. The most profound, confusing thing to followers of Jesus are to walk into a church and sense no discernible hunger for the presence of God. It's a, it's, it's a baffler. I think for those who do, like again, when I walk into somewhere, like we, even if I walk into your house and you're a foodie, I should discern a hunger for the presence of the meal. It's true. And so we as followers of Jesus, and it's not only an external thing, but it is a place on the inside of saying, God, would you do things that are not typical? And not just to see like untypical things or that's not even a word, but let's pretend it was. Like it's not just there. It is this place for you and I to engage God in a way that absolutely transforms our hungers for other things in this world. This is how Jesus lived. Fast forward to the age of 30. As we see Jesus going through the waters of baptism, we see the same thing. Jesus abiding in and then preparing to minister from the Father's love. In Matthew chapter three, verse 16 to 17, it says, and when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens, excuse me, were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him, and behold, a voice from heaven said, this is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. And church, The voice of the Father affirms the Son and the Spirit is present. We see the fullness of the Trinity in this picture. And the voice of the Father says, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And when Jesus taught us to pray, he didn't teach us to pray in any other way saying, not my Father, but our Father. And one of the greatest tragedies in 2023 is that some of you do not know that you are loved by the God of the universe. And so you live your life trying to earn an inferior love when your Father's love is everything that you need. 
It's not, it's not, again, that's not hyperbolic and it's not just a statement. It is actually something that you can abide in. And everything your spiritual enemy will do will try to find you and lead you to abide in something else than what your Father has for you. For Jesus, the call to be and to abide with his Father was a first priority, and the call to minister second, and it was always in this order. He has a deep and profound love for his Father, for his Father's house, for his Father's people, and then, of course, yes, all people. And Jesus, from 12 to 30, he grows, continues growing in wisdom and in favor. And of the outflow of a hunger for God's presence, for God's place, and then for his purpose, Jesus ministers and he teaches and he heals and he saves and he sets people free. Jesus does something that is fascinating. He can be working over here, setting somebody free and simultaneously frustrating somebody else who wants just the form but not the actual power of God. It's a remarkable thing that Jesus, did you know sometimes when Jesus is moving in your life, he is frustrating somebody else? Have you ever seen somebody got blessed and it bugs you that they got blessed? Why do they get blessed? Pre-COVID, Lori and I had the privilege to do prison packs for two years. I've told this story before. It takes, about five, it takes about five hours, six hours to do it. It's, it's slow. You go to each cell, and sometimes there's unrest, and you have to wait for it to quiet to go into each cell. So it's, it's, a, it's, an, it's, a, it's a whole day. And it's a humbling day. It really is. And we were going through the day, and it was beautiful. And then Lori and I came to the unit that was segregated because everybody in this unit was a sexual offender. And the w chaplain at the time was Carl Wake, put his hand on the door to let us in, and I didn't want to go in, because I didn't think they were deserving. And I didn't know this moment was coming. I'm not preaching it like this, this moment like where they're gonna get blessed. Here I was like, I don't think they deserve it. And then me and the Holy Spirit had a quick little moment. Like, what am I deserving of? God does not love me any more than he loves them. Well, oh, there's different consequences for what they've done, don't misunderstand me. But it is this moment, this profound moment God will choose to bless people. Listen, the gospel's offensive, man. He will choose to forgive someone who confesses and repents. And someone who chooses not to, he will say to them, your will be done. It is offensive. Which leads me to the last thing I wanted to say. Following Palm Sunday, as we're gonna go through this week, it's gonna get us to the Garden of Gethsemane, where Jesus gives us one more profound insight into how he grew in wisdom and favor. And I wonder, I just wonder if, if you know specifically what Jesus says. In Matthew chapter 26, verses 41, he says these two things, watch and pray. Watch meaning like be alert, pray, look to the Father, because then he says this, when you take the posture of being awake and attentive and focused on the Father, then from that place, abiding in the love of the Father, Jesus also says, you're in contested space, so pray and wa watch and pray, what? That you may not enter into, notice he doesn't say enter into sin, he says enter into temptation. The battle, granted, was not the place of sin, it's actually way before that. He is gracious and he is good if we confess and we repent to redeem and restore all things, but his heart is that we would have revelation of where we're being tempted so that we would not follow it all the way through. God's original heart is to thwart what the enemy is doing. His second thing, of course, is to redeem and restore. 
But his original heart is, God's original heart is to prepare us, not just to repair us, is what I'm saying. He can do this extraordinarily well, but he doesn't want us sometimes to go through what sin creates and causes in us and in others. And then Jesus says something. He says, the spirit is indeed willing. You don't have a spirit problem. You got a flesh issue. The flesh is weak. In that exact garden, the disciples, flesh sleeps, but Jesus prays. He's different. One of his disciples, when Jesus is gonna get arrested, you'll see it, takes out a sword and lops off the ear of a soldier. So flesh wounds other people. What does Jesus do? Jesus heals. He's different. Flesh betrays, Judas betrays him with a kiss. What is the language of Jesus when he's experiencing betrayal? He sucks at Judas at the Last Supper and he calls him friend. So flesh betrays and Jesus befriends. Jesus is different. And it's not on the outside that he's different. It's his inner life. Since he was a boy, Jesus and Jerusalem have been inseparable. Only this visit is different. The visit that Jesus has this week in Jerusalem is he's not there to linger in the temple. He's there to lay down his life so that the veil between us and God can be ripped into and we can have access to God's presence in a way that the Old Testament individuals would only have dreamed. Sometimes it's wise to keep our options open. Other time it's cowardly to do so. Luke 9 verse 51 says, when the days drew near for him to be taken up, Jesus set his face to Jerusalem. In Luke chapter 9 verse 62, he quotes an Old Testament story. He says, no one who puts his hand to the plow and then looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. You're not created by God simply to be a tool that God uses. You're created by God to be a child of God. And abiding in the affection of the Father, yeah, God is gonna use your life, but you're not a chisel, you're a child. Last story. In India, when people would confess faith in Christ, they would teach them a song and it's actually a song that we now know as a hymn. It originates in a new believers class in India. And I'm gonna sing it. And you're gonna immediately begin to sing with me. <laughs> this is a choir moment, not a solo. If it is a choir, it will be beautiful. If it is a solo, Lord have mercy. <laughs> Here's the song that they would teach new believers. You ready? I'll start. If you know it, sing it. I have decided Church, don't settle for being a chisel when you're created to be a child. May God give you the courage and the grace to fulfill what you just sang.